Brendan Whitty, I'm a PhD student at uh, University of East Anglia. Uh, one, uh, my, my question sort of comes a little bit from uh, sort of the historical aspect, and I'm kind of wondering what the difference is between some of the PDIA approaches to the participatory paradigm that we had like 15 years ago. Um, uh, you know, it's local, both are local, both sort of imply good enough research, both are sort of focus on monitoring and so on. So I'm, I'm sort of interested in seeing how, mm. how you see this as being different to that. Thanks very much, Brendan. Owen. Hi, I'm Owen Barder from the Centre for Global Development. Um, fantastic talk and, and great ideas. I, I have a question of clarification that I would want to understand better about the idea of locally built and designed and evolved solutions. Uh, your post office example, for example, it, it's, in, it's striking that when a post office, most post offices look pretty much the same, successful post offices. Um, it, it doesn't feel obvious that you would want your post office to look very different in different countries to reflect local circumstances. Um, so is, is the point that we have to design solutions locally to reflect local circumstances? Or is, it, is the point that there's something about the organic problem, the effort of solving the problem locally, that somehow makes the institution function in a way that um, somehow bringing it in from the outside uh, doesn't succeed in reproducing? What, what is it about having it grow organically? That y what, what do you get from that? That you can't, that you that you don't get from transplanting institutions, or is simply the point that you have to know a lot more about that, that the institutions do in fact reflect their local environment in subtle and different ways that perhaps aren't obvious to us from the outside. Wh which which of those two things is it that we're trying to do, or perhaps it's both? Thanks very much, Owen. Anyone from the middle block? Yes, you want to here. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. My name's Rupert Simons. I work for the Africa Governance Initiative. Um, I am very interested in the question of capability traps and how to get out of them. So capability trap, as I understand it, is when you um, build things that look good uh, rather than things that work because the incentives in the system favor you doing that. Uh, I've spent the last two years working in Liberia, which got itself into a big old capability trap as part of trying to get debt relief because to get debt relief you have to tick a bunch of boxes which involves creating institutions that look good. And the government is now trying very hard to get out of that capability trap and to get itself into a system where it's actually spending aid money on useful things and it's spending its own tax money on useful things, but it's incredibly hard. Uh, so I would love to hear if you have any examples of countries or part sectors within countries that have successfully got out of a capability trap, by which I mean they were able to change either the domestic <coughs> politics or the donor <coughs> politics or both so that aid started and tax money started going towards things that were useful rather than things that looked good. Right. Thanks very much, Rupert. Sheila. Uh, thank you, uh, Sheila Page, ODI. There seemed to be a rather a contradiction between your sort of locally designed and projects and all words like that and your examples of things like mountaineering. In other words, what you're talking about in those contexts is identifying good people good people, skilled people, people who know how to run a post office or climb a mountain, as opposed to identifying a good climbing opportunity. And that, in terms of aid, or would be means identifying, let us say, the best country managers and giving them the money to do what they like with, <laughs> rather than anything such as identifying that you need to improve the institutions. Is that what you're saying? And if so, is that a possible strategy for any donor, because uh, it, it's something of my own experience is more in allocating research money. And again, you always have the question, are you choosing the project or are you choosing the researcher? And we certainly never resolved that, but I'm not sure you've resolved it either. You're not really talking about locally designed project. You're talking about good local designers, and that seems quite different. Great, thanks very much, Sheila. Um, Michael, I'm going to load you up with one last question before <laughs> we come over this side. Okay. Next time. We're up to ten. Uh, <laughs> yeah. okay. um, it's, it's a very simple one. It's, um, I mean, you've put a lot of emphasis on state 
as, as or <coughs> making states work, state capability, mm -hmm. as the contemporary problem. Um, there are clearly some very pressing problems that have been resolved pretty well, if you like, despite the state. Um, I'm thinking of things like the telecommunications issues in Africa, where, you know, mm. ten years ago you li it was a problem of sorting out so you didn't have to pay bribes to get your landline, sorry, 20 years ago, I'm giving away my generation here. Um, whereas, you know, that, that issue is clearly now by the by, you know, something happened in the ecosystem around that was quite profound. Um, so it's just a question about, it's a question about the loading, really, that you've given that particular issue of state capability, building state capability I as the development problem, the contemporary <coughs> development problem. But anyway, I shall no, no, just, uh, leave just, you just, with just that. Like yeah. you just, as a part, like, why are we not focusing on private sector as having the same problems, is that what you mean? Or it's more a question of it, some forms of transformational change coming from outside. Oh, from right. the ecosystem around the state right. and that changing the problematic that the state has to deal with. Okay. Uh, it was just, the, 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 I was struck by the comments you made that the contemporary issue oh. of the 21st century is yeah. sorting out state capability. So right. it was just a, a okay. slight challenge on that. Okay. Um, first of all, thanks to everybody for your questions and comments and concerns. Um, this very process is, I like to think, is PDAA in action, right? Someone mm. puts out an idea, you think it's okay, you think it's terrible, we talk about it, uh, we mull it over, we uh, go back and try it again, and we get improve it. That's kind of what we're doing. This is what professional practice and seminars and all the rest of it are routinized into our lives as how we conduct things. And I just want, in, in writ large, I sort of think this is how we should deal with a lot of problems, actually. <laughs> we should uh, not imagine that we have the answer to the problem. We have an idea, we have a set of plausible conjectures about how, what the problem fundamentally is or looks like, what drives it, and then we put it out and see what people make of it. And I, so I, I don't sort of have QED answers to all the questions that you have posed, because there in some cases aren't. And if it was fully fledged uh, already, then we wouldn't then it wouldn't be a need to have a debate about it. Or if there was if there was an answer and we kind of nailed it, then someone else probably went in and it was easy to do that. Someone probably would have figured it out a long time ago. So uh, I'm going to answer some of the questions as best as uh, try and integrate the, some of the questions and provide responses to them. But it's um, I would like to think that this process, the very act of putting ideas out and questioning and challenging itself is kind of what I wish would happen a lot more, not just amongst the chattering classes of development, but actually be how we think about uh, issues more generally. So um, that said, <laughs> what I think sort of characterizes what we're trying to do, and, the, and not just us, I keep coming back to that. I think it's, as I said, I'm, I've a, I'm optimistic by nature. I like to think that we're swimming in a bigger ocean here of people rough thinking along roughly similar lines and that these kind of seminars help to sort of provide bridges to connect people that have otherwise been thinking about some of this stuff um, independently or um, in different within different organizations. But what I'd like to think is different about this stuff is it is very much connected to this the, uh, sort of a, a diagnosis about why the system is stuck the way it is. <laughs> and this idea of, uh, of, of capability traps or of isomorphic mimic or any of these sort of ways in which people are able to uh, per perpetuate a system over long periods of time and not have uh, see any discernible changes in the functionality of the system as opposed to what the system might look like and I think is a very is a very is a very pervasive one and uh, so when we connect it to a diagnosis of, of what sort of, of how a, a logic of development can uh, enable vast sets of resources to, to keep on being spent without a lot of improvement, um, I think we need a good explanation of that, but I think we need a strategy for trying to to uh, to try and change it. And I think isomorphic mimicry is a game played by all of the people that that Philip's concerned about, who are like their houses in Paris and all the rest of it, and can set up a world in which they can keep everybody happy uh, in their in their immediate uh, counterpart universe, precisely by faking it, by by claiming to change, by passing all sorts of nice laws. Um, but not actually being able to, uh, and living in a, in a space where there is no immediate feedback and, try and, and when they're held accountable for that. I guess I'm also somewhat optimistic in the sense that I've decided the strategy of trying to move this from idea to action um, has been uh, f being able to find uh, not just c colleagues within the World Bank but in the donor community who are actually willing to support this. Yes, the DNA of the organizations that we work for are kind of not structured to do this kind of work, uh, but you know, 
just as Vapora is not sort of three or four people, it's 50 or 60 people working in 16 countries that have received $20 million in funding from the bank and from outside by people who've risked their own budgets in some, in some sense, their own annual reviews and their own careers by saying, we're going to punt on these crazy people who've actually got a very different way of engaging with a really, really hard problem. And if the world was as isomorphic and horrible as I might sometimes be seen, I, don't, would, I would have been fired a long time ago, I would have been laughed out of existence and would never have got anywhere. Uh, we've been able to make a case to Wazade in the case of this Solomon Islands kind of work by helping them, by even appealing to their in instincts about, really, is this a, you think you're fundamentally changing the justice system by building these nice courthouses and over, initially over a beer, but over a sense, and then initially you know, over in, into a more serious convening in Canberra and elsewhere. People say, no, if, if we want to change the system, we have, to, we have to think about it very differently. We have to convene people in a very different way. We, and that word came, uh, is, it needs to be expanded, not just to be something that we, the experts, and we, the people, that think we know what the problems and solutions are to find what those are. We becomes a more encompassing term by which our, our immediate legal counterparts, in the sense of uh, government uh, officials, uh, we citizens of, of, of both our own countries and the countries we're giving to are seen as part of a broader dialogical process by which uh, solutions are prioritised and, and, um, and nominated and prioritised. So um, it's, I, I, you know, and why I use the examples of the, from history before us also, you know, people were foolish when they tried to end slavery. People were when Mary Wollstonecraft wrote the vindication of the rights of women, when she you know, was there a beauty, fully fledged plan about how that was going to work? Did you expect everybody to greet her with uh, cries of genius and wonder about how this is all going to work? No. You, you try and change something. You try and put an idea out there. You try and articulate it as forcefully as you can, and you change it through a social movement. And that's how all the big changes have occurred, and we've got to have one in development itself. And so I'm less, way less worried about the fact that. Uh, is this donor or that donor going to like this or not? And so in the first instance, I find the people who get this and who have their own sufficient, uh, robust, authorizing environment to let us do this kind of stuff. All right? And I can name 20 people on the World Bank with senior country management level, country director level of authority who've let us run around really scary places like Cambodia and like uh, Ken northern parts of the arid lands of Kenya and Sierra Leone for nearly a decade doing this kind of stuff. And have, been, have, been, have kept us there, even when regime changes come at the, from the bank staff itself, because the government itself wants this kind of work to be done. So I'm not. Th yes, there are. Sure, we've all had encounters with a politician that wants their house in Paris. But part of the interrogation of diversity is actually there are real, actually are public servants who really do want to take public service seriously and change their country. And I'm not that cynical about that. You, but they're not everyone. And then maybe there's only a handful. The, the, one of the best new cases that the bank itself has just done recently is on Edo State in Nigeria. Seemingly very boring case about making the, the road systems work better. But this is a, you know, a guy that actually took seriously the, the, his job as governor and that actually to build roads and, and tax the population and spend money on, on pro-development kinds of tasks. How did he do that? almost by defying the experts that told him what the right procurement strategy was going to be and how he had to follow these rules if he wanted to get money from the donors and da 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 The whole point of this case study is that when a domestic political actor was had the uh, chutzpah, had the courage to be able to try and forge a very different way that often was in direct uh, contradiction to the way in which the experts were telling him to go about doing it, he was able to not only do a more effective job, he was able to, he was able to build his own legitimacy and, 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 and on the basis of, of a credible, demonstrable improvement in the quality of something as boring as roads, but actually something as important as roads. So documenting that, th th there's not always and everywhere, uh, the, 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 there was always variability. I hope that was one of the points you took from what I said, and that applies for the good guys and the bad guys. <laughs> and what we, and the, the narrower sense of development professionals, I think need to be much more cognizant of as part of our homework uh, of amongst ourselves, amongst our own, our own organization, is figuring out where these uh, pockets might exist for being able to try out different kinds of things. Right? If we just see ourselves as bureaucrats showing up every day to tick over money into a pension, that's kind of boring. I see my job as trying to make social theory, social ideas work in a big organization that's trying to, you know, on a good day, figure out <laughs> how to change big system-wide uh, aspects that affect people's lives. And I'm willing to try and risk that. I'm willing to try and put teams of people together. I'm willing to spend decades of my life trying to do that, not because I think I've nailed the question up front or because there's a whole uh, array of tools waiting to be used. It's we'll figure out how to do that. And that's the, that's the really fun part of doing this and investing enormous amounts of time and energy in local counterparts 
The reason I teach at the Kennedy School is because the consulting shops in Washington don't produce the kinds of people I need to do this kind of work. So I fly every week of my life between Boston and Washington because I want to train up a new generation of people that will get this in their soul and figure out how to actually try and make it work. All right? And we put them in, the f in countries for three or four, in some cases, 10 years at a time to learn local languages, to figure out how to be a, a legitimate, credible interlocutor taking this thing called social science and making it, make it actionable, making it usable and useful in that, in that local context. One of my great success stories is one of, my, uh, one of our um, five-year veteran employees in Sierra Leone who just got into the mid-career program at the Kennedy School. He spent two years of his life growing up in a, in a, ref in a refugee uh, settlement in Liberia during the middle of a civil war. And the, but he can speak development as well as anybody in this room. <laughs> but he knows his country way better than anybody in this room. And he's, uh, I mean, you don't get those kind of people just by short-term actions. You, you mentor them. You give them a space to recognize that their kind of expertise that they have and the insights and the credibility and competence they have to be able to be effective counterparts is really uh, what only they can do. So the we then is, is an encompassing idea. It's not just what, I think in the first instance, yes, we are, you know, our salaries and our, legal responsibilities uh, uh, within the organizations we work for, but I think we uh, need to see that we're, we're part of a broader, this broader process of social change and, that it, 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 and it's, uh, to the extent it's seen as an us-them kind of thing rather than a, an, a, a more encompassing process of change, um, then it's, it's that in itself delegitimizes it. As to the content question, I think that's really, that Owen's uh, question, which is really good. Uh, our, one of our other things is just that the, the, the legitimacy of the change process itself is really fundamental. I th I'd like to think that's a, another one of the things that we've finally, maybe as a field, uh, got a better handle on. That uh, People will deal with disappointment. Like we said we deal with elections when we think that the process was fair. We deal with disappointments in not getting research grants when we think that the process of adjudication was fair. And I think people will, will deal with change in their own lives in developing countries if they think that the process is fair. But most of the time it just isn't. It's wretchedly unfair how it happens and, and why people resist it, why they fight it, why they burn down their government offices and police stations because there's just deep, deep injustice built into the way that they perceive and counter this process called development. So that's what contesting development, the very title of the book was a twofold process on contesting the very Id of the d idea or the logic of how development was set up and saying development itself is contested. It, has, it always is, has been and will continue to be. But it becomes a little less so, as per that array that I showed you, when there's, when there's some sense of, of local legitimacy bought into the way in which that change process unfolds. And one of the ways in which you can you know, build legitimacy is partly just by doing what you said you're going to do and actually building a functional system that does actually respond to the concerns of people. But, but you give it the, the content of that is born of the very fact that it comes through a legitimate process itself. Though I hope that answers, answer, answers though what I was getting at, that oftentimes it's not obvious what the, what the right content is, or even if it is obvious what a content would be, it's qualitatively different when it's come through a process of, of dialogue and consultation. Uh, the signature example we use at the Kennedy School is the Northern Ireland Peace Accords. They're not, they're, there's no legal genius in the words that actually constituted the, the wording that, that made that happen, but it, the legitimacy that gave it political traction, that gave it legitimacy in the eyes of he was it took a 30-year process of two steps forward and five steps back in order to get something eventually, painfully, that everybody could finally agree. So the technical solution could have been written by a lawyer 100 years ago, probably, but to actually get an answer that people bought into needed a legitimate process, which was ugly, painful, messy, horrible, but it got there in the end. And in our world of log frames and five year time frames, we just, the very act of upholding procurement rules delegitimizes the processes often that, we, that we're trying to turn the work around. So that's, that's kind of the meta picture, I guess, for what I'm trying to articulate here. I'm not trying to, I've got a new tool, and I'm gonna try and convince you that it's the best thing ever and you should do it, right? It's a, set of, it's a process of putting a set of ideas into a public domain, doing what we think is a legitimate process by which ideas get refined, which is do what we're doing now, and over a process that we, is only clear with the benefit of hindsight, not in real time like now, somehow it coalesces into something that starts to take hold, and my, somewhat jaundiced or biased view is that we're kind of in this really interesting phase, but whether in the big picture sense of uh, uh, the 400 year process by which change is occurring or in the, on this big divergence that's occurring, but I think uh, we're, the, we're at a recognition that, that we, 
that the 21st sensibilities and technologies available to us can help us to revisit some of these big crystal challenges that we've otherwise parked on the too hard basket. And uh, if we do that, if we can get that right in ways that will only be clear with the benefit of hindsight, then then I think we have a profession that we can be proud of. Then I think we're, we don't have to apologize for what we do. We have to see ourselves as part of the problem. We can see that there is a there is something that this crazy thing business called development can do. And it doesn't have to be because we know the answers. But we do know some things. We do have resources. But getting that giving and receiving right, that's the ancient, ancient challenge. It's the opening chapter of Bob Clitgard's book, uh, Tropical Gangsters, one of the best books of the 20th century, according to the New York Times. <laughs> Getting the, the ancient art of giving and receiving right is, is the essence of development assistance, it seems to me. And for too long, it's not been right. And it's because we haven't paid attention to the legitimacy of change processes. We've assumed that problems have answers that only a certain select group of people know uh, the response to. And some, some, some problems, yes, there are the answers like that. We do know that immunizing babies is a good thing. We don't need to reinvent that wheel. Um, but there are a whole bunch of other problems that are just qualitatively, ontologically, phenomenologically not in that space. And uh, my general point to which I'll conclude is to say that the more we deal with those low-hanging issues, the more these other ones just keep coming up. And um, there's no way around it. <laughs> Sooner or later, we've got to en encounter these and address these in a better way. And um, I hope that collectively, not just me, you, us, everybody, has to uh, try and do that. And how we get from where we are to where we need to be will happen this pretty much the same way it's happened in the past. A social movement will do it. People will figure out in a way that's only clear with the benefit of hindsight how we'll get there. And I offer what I can do. You offer what you can do. We put it in the basket. We mix it all up. We see what happens. And uh, that's where we go. Thanks. Thanks very much indeed, Mike. I think we're close to out of time now, so apologies to anyone who I didn't get to on the questions. Um, Pilar, um, Philip, do you want to add anything at this point? I mean, maybe just to end by saying that I think it should be celebrated that we are somehow we are moving forward in the debate on how to engage with context, with complexity, with nonlinearity, and that that is at the heart of a lot of donor debates in a way that wasn't the case ten years ago. So, I, yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, final word, which is that at five o'clock there'll be a book launch event here um, with Lisa Denny um, from the Politics and Governance team. Um, Mike will be one of the discussants um, on this on the book that Lisa's just produced, Justice and Security Reform, Development Agencies and Informal Institutions in Sierra Leone. So we hope that some of you at least will be able to get to that. Many thanks, Mike. That was very rich Thank and um, uh, good discussion. Many thanks to you, Thank you. and to the discussants. Thank you. Thank you.